to interrupt. Right. I see that the discussion already has started, and that's a really good sign. <laughs> so um, it shows that our panelists are um, really have something to say to each other, and I'm happy that they will share this with us um, just in a few moments. Welcome to everybody. My name is Claire Hoffmann. I'm curator here at Centre Culturel Suisse, and I'm really delighted to have this um, evening today with these panelists, that, which I will introduce in just a few seconds. Um, so the idea of this um, evening um, was to um, accompany the exhibition of da Denis Berci um, of a discursive um, moment and to invite um, people who um, have other perspectives onto um, the artistic material um, that she used. And um, so maybe you already saw the show that is upstairs, or you will have a moment afterwards um, to see the exhibition and see what uh, we will be talking about. Um, and um, of course, I would also like to thank the partners for um, who teamed up with us for this event. Um, it is the Nemo Biennale, um, which we had already the second chance, uh, um, the second time that we collaborated um, with the Nemo Biennale, uh, Biennale for uh, Digital Arts. Um, uh, the headquarter is at the Sancat, if you have a chance to go there to see the show. And then um, our second partner is Engadin Art Talks. Um, and so this evening today uh, inscribes itself into a series of um, talks that Engadin Art Talk is organizing outside of Switzerland. Um, and I will just hand over to, to uh, Christina in a few moments. Um, <laughs> first, I will, I will take the chance to introduce the panelists um, very briefly. So um, we have the honor to welcome Professor Heonik Kwon. Heonik Kwon is senior researcher, fellow in social anthropology at uh, Trinity College University in, of Cambridge, and currently part of the research group ASA Research Center in Seoul National University. And um, uh, Heonik Kwon is specialized in social history of the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and the Korean War. And um, Heonik Kwon was also um, author in the book that um, is lying on the table and that was published on the occasion of the exhibition. Um, then obviously the artist Denis Berci is with us tonight. Um, her work is focusing on research um, and archive material and on the relationships of Switzerland with various um, parts of the uh, um, the world and um, how, um, what post-colonial implications there are between Switzerland and in this exhibition, specifically Korea and South Africa. Um, she holds an MA in Visual Arts at the head d'école d'art in Geneva and also has a PhD ongoing, uh, part of which is published in this book. And um, this conversation will be moderated by Adina May, who is managing editor of After All, Journal of Art, Context, and Inquiry, in, and the research fellow at Central St. Martin's University, and um, has also uh, written a lot on uh, curatorial projects, is engaged with the histories and theories of moving images. So thank you very much to the three of you to be here, and I'm handing over to Christina Bechtler, who is the founder of Engadin Art Talks, and will give a brief introduction into what Engadin Art Talks are about, and especially this year's topic. Thank you so much, Claire, um, and very welcome from the Engadin Art Talks. The Engadin Art Talk is a forum um, in Switzerland, based in the Engadin, in Swartz, actually. And since over 12 years, we invite um, people, creative people, artists, architects, um, poetry and uh, performances for a symposium up there. Uh, with an always changing team every year, we have a new team, a new theme, and this year's theme is long durée. So as we couldn't make the long durée in reality, actually, uh, up there in the mountain due to COVID, 
Um, Claire Hoffman interviewed, for example, just to, to mention one of 40 of the contributions with Ethel. She had a discussion here, we recorded with Ethel Adnan. It was very successful, the whole thing. We had over 12,000 people watching. So we hope we will have more watching this now, which will be recorded as well. To the theme, long durée. Um, the French historian, Fernand Prodel, advocated the long durée, a view of history, which relegates the historical importance of news events beneath slow shifts over centuries and occasional crises in the grand underlying structure of human civilization. Extinction is a phenomenon that belongs to long durée, the symptoms of which we are now beginning to experience as news. And I think pretty much that art, architecture, and what you're researching, what you are doing, is a, a, it's a perspective which is also endeavor in the theme of long durée. Please go ahead, and in, and uh, I enjoy the interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Christina, and thank you, Claire, for the lovely introduction. So um, I have the very uh, pleasurable task and honor to, to, to moderate uh, what promises to be a very exciting conversation uh, between uh, Ronnie Kwon and uh, Denise Berchi. Um, as it was already mentioned, um, you know, we, we, we've already been having uh, actually very exciting uh, conversation. So uh, hopefully, you know, it's just um, a continuation of, uh, of, um, of really a, a, a friendly and um, intellectually rich um, uh, exchange. And um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, um, I'm very glad to be here because I think we have a, a, a real encounter here, an encounter between uh, a social scientist, an anthropologist, and an artist who's also a researcher who borrows, you know, from methods um, from 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 these fields, and um, there's obviously a lot of um, of uh, points of contact, uh, mutual interest, uh, but which are of course uh, materialized and actualized in very different ways. Uh, on one side, uh, academic publishing, and on the other side, also academic publishing. But as you saw, or uh, as you will be able to see afterwards. Uh, installations, moving image work. Um, and another thing that uh, Denise and, and Honig uh, have in common, I think, is a certain relationship, relationship to, to history. I think both of you um, have this interest for cracks in the grand narratives of history from which you, um, you, 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 you produce um, uh, narratives from, let's say, the margins or uh, minor histories in the sense of Gilles Deleuze and, 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 and Guattari. Um, on, one, on, on the one hand, with Honig, um, uh, we have approaches that, that try to rethink uh, global conflicts. Uh, and as Claire mentioned, um, the Cold War, the Korean War. And on the other hand, Denise, who looks at uh, the grand myth of uh, Swiss uh, neutrality. Uh, and I know that both of you want to start with uh, giving a bit of, uh, of, uh, of, of context, uh, but my first question to both of you would be to uh, perhaps um, just tell us about how you came to you know, um, approach the, 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 your ob objects of research from the perspective that, that, that uh, you have developed um, in your respective uh, practices. So perhaps we'll start with uh, Denise. Hello, and a very warm welcome also from my side. Um, it is actually true that I have been maybe as one of these um, uh, Swiss soldiers here with a, uh, with a camera in their hand. I was, during my master's, I went to Korea in a course, which I did, you know, chose to go. And we visited demilitarized zone, I mean, kind of as close as you can get in Korea. And um, one day we would visit a Swiss neutral mission, in, a military mission in close to the Korean, um, 
you know, divided zone, which kind of uh, divides the north and the south, as we all know. And I was like, okay, what, what, what are these men doing here? Actually, there were just five Swiss men um, in a neutral role. And that actually became a very founding moment for me because, um, yeah, like the, the Swiss neutrality became really one of my big questions of research. So what does it mean to be neutral? How did Switzerland play out this role to be neutral in their history? Of course, that changed a lot, and uh, I'm still busy with this question today. So yes, this would be my answer. All right. <coughs> Bonsoir à tous. Good um, My take is, I mean, I, I was provoked by Denise to think about this particular theme. Um, thinking through the concept of neutrality, which is vital for European politics, particularly to the existence of Swiss state. Um, but on the other hand, I think neutral existence is very much part of human ordinary life. And then uh, in the context of civil war, um, the, I came to discover through engaging with this particular event, um, that actually there are wars, there are conflicts that are specifically bent on uh, destroying the space of ordinary neutral existence of human social, uh, intersocial, and intimate lives. And so um, neutrality came to appear in a new light to me through preparations for this event. So um, uh, the, my talk will be uh, a bit about that. Thank you. you you're both interested um, in you know, um, excavating archives um, to, 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 to rewrite history. And some of the, these archives, like as in the work of, uh, of Denise, um, belong to what would be called you know, micro history. They're not part of the big uh, of the big narrative, of the official narrative. Um, and in the text that you wrote for, for, for um, in the book, uh, Honig, you mentioned um, a diary uh, by, by, um, uh, by a Korean historian who recorded events uh, during the, the, the um, uh, when Seoul was occupied by, by the North, if I'm, correct me if I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrong. And um, you use that as an example um, to, 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 that could trigger new directions um, for, for historical research and to rewrite uh, some, of, um, some of these historical accounts. Like Denise used um, uh, you know, video recordings, uh, film recordings, excuse me, uh, by, by, by Swiss soldiers. Um, so my question for, for both of you would be, <coughs> About, about the role of, um, of um, yeah, this, uh, an ex exca unexcavated uh, archives and perhaps um, um, the role of, of artistic research, uh, the role of uh, anthropological research um, to, 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 to render them legible um, and, you know, uh, sort of like recontextualize them um, um, and the value they have you know, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, uh, to articulate new, new discourses, really. Yeah, so maybe to, to go into what it means to work with archives, I could just show you some slides uh, that you get an idea of the book that we published um, for the occasion of this exhibition. It's called State Fiction, The Gaze of the Swiss Neutral Mission in the Korean Demilitarized Zone. Um, for this project, it was really the goal to, I, I discovered an archive in the military archive of Switzerland, um, which from the beginning was introduced to me as a military non-relevant archive. And I thought this was an interesting starting point for me as an artist and a researcher to see what can this material, which was photographic, and as you said, film, uh, film, what can this tell me 
uh, how can I kind of analyze and enter as these two men um, into the gaze of what they saw? So the whole exhibition that you see upstairs is basically uh, this book. It's photographs that were taken by Swiss soldiers in a neutral agency in that sense after the Korean War. Um, or after the ceasefire, we have to be precise, in 1953, where Switzerland was called into um, um, a compound, let's say, of four nations, four neutral nations, um, to oversee the ceasefire. So what I did is basically analyze these Swiss soldiers as photographers. Of course, they were all amateur photographers. They didn't have... A, kind of a, um, a mandate to go and document what they're doing. They were there as military men um, having to overview, right, like a, a, a Cold War conflict. But at the side, it happened that they were really producing a lot of photographs. Um, of course, they were based in a small, uh, they, they had a little base, which became kind of a, the Swiss club, they called it. So I was very interested in the reproduction of national um, images, national identity, um, which then was represented in the book and also in the film that you see upstairs by quotes from their diaries, from reports that I found in the archive. So it's kind of, um, I'm trying to create tension between the images that I'm publishing and the quotes from the archive, from their diaries, from how they perceived what they saw, what they encountered, coming from a country which was, in, their, in that sense, very far away, right? Like they would arrive in Korea, they had in the 1950s, not really uh, an idea where they would arrive. They had no idea of Korean culture. Um, and what does that produce? So, we see a lot of clashes, a lot of hybrid situations where they would try to kind of create their own home, called like their Swiss home, with like plants, they would say, with their, um, maybe their cantonal flags and so on. But obviously they created a new kind of infrastructure of peace or of so-called peace, you know, where, um, then they would, of course, also introduce, uh, get introduced to the local communities, the rural areas. And how did these encounters happen? How did the, these Swiss men, they were only men, this is also an important point to make for me. It's really a very, um, a gaze which was purely masculine, uh, we can say. So how did these uh, images even um, get into being of what, uh, uh, Ariella Azulay also calls, you know, the civil contract of photography. What is the contract? How did these photographs come here? And we see here an interesting uh, um, encounter where like a Swiss soldier would like to take photographs of a woman working in a, in a nearby village. And what did he do? He offered a cigarette. And so there were these kind of small traits, so he was able to take his photographs. And in the diaries, we can also see a lot that actually the Korean people were not, they didn't really like to be photographed. So what does this, these images, what does that mean today? So yeah, this was kind of a way I worked through the archive. And um, there obviously were certain topics that reappeared. A lot of it was also this encounter with you know, women, Korean women, children, um, above all, we can, if you get really into the material, kind of feel a certain superiority of the Swiss, like we bring you peace. We are the ones coming from democratic culture. We can serve you and bring you something. And so I was quite interested in this very small um, encounter. So. Exactly. You can, you have time afterwards to look at the book. And um, yeah, I think this was one way. The other way is by the film, where I edited a lot of the filmic material, so they wouldn't only take photographs, but also film. And what's quite interesting, you can afterwards really just go upstairs and watch the film. I'm not going to show it now. <laughs> um, is because this material is amateur material, we can kind of see quite honestly 
how, how they were watching, right? Like by, for example, activating the zoom, they would kind of zoom to what they saw, what was of interest to them. Sometimes it was, to be a bit mean now, was like legs of women, <laughs> or it was, um, and by, by kind of zooming very fast, you could kind of analyze this gaze in a very interesting way. So, exactly, this is kind of the way I approached uh, this visual material. Of course, I also wrote about it, a uh, long text here. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, there are several ways to, 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 to contextualize your, your approach and uh, look at the, uh, the visual mater material you, you used and the way you, you, re you reworked it. Um, but there's um, a very interesting uh, point um, in your text in which you, you, you mentioned the, um, uh, the exposure of the Swiss soldiers to mainstream American cinema, uh, screenings that were organized uh, as part of the, of the, of the, um, of the, um, of the, of the, of the uh, civic or civil life of the American soldiers. And the Swiss soldiers would, would actually use that as, um, as, a, as a toolbox, you know, to invent their own uh, visual language, or at least, you know, try to replicate something that they had seen. So in relation to uh, the, the title of your work, you know, state fiction, there's uh, an, actual, an actual fictionalization, uh, f uh, you know, fictionalizing, fiction, yeah, fictionalizing um, by, the, by the, the, the Swiss soldiers themselves, and they enact and perform, um, you know, these values of, of neutrality uh, through, uh, through filming, through, through, through framing, uh, and um, although it still, uh, it still was in a, in a relatively um, restrained circle, but these, these films were actually, actually, actually screened uh, in, 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 in Korea as part of, um, as part of, uh, as part of their non-military uh, activities. But again, where do you actually draw, draw, draw the line? Um, but I think just to, um, you know, uh, remain in the, in the frame of the encounter between your work and, and, and Honig, um, I would be interested in, you know, to know, um, I mean, you mentioned that, that, that working specifically for, for this project made you uh, look at, at, um, at, um, at new material um, uh, and eventually rethink certain things. Um, um, but I would be really curious to know um, what the kind of historical narrative produced by a visual artwork mm. does to your own work um, in, you know, which addresses uh, similar, a similar field and, uh, and uh, which is driven by, by similar questions and, and, and mm. problematics. Mm. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Could you help me? Uh, yes. Dennis? Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, very, very briefly, I was given five minutes. <laughs> so, entire history of Cold War as such uh, in Asia. It, it, if you think of Korean War as the uh, beginning of... The, my past years, I've been doing this Cold War studies with a few colleagues in how Cold War was like in Europe, particularly in, in Germany, and then how it was like in Asian context, and uh, what, it was, what it is like to live in a Cold War society without actually war, and what it is like to live in a Cold War society that involves armed conflict, and are these two the same Cold War. But if you think of Korean War as the launching point of Cold War in Pacific Asia as such, and follow the historians that it was supposed to end in Afghanistan, and neither Korean conflict or Afghan conflict ended as such, so it continues to some extent. Uh, whereas in Europe, it's definitely over. Well, I mean, in certain circles, yet n not really, but it's definitely over. So uh, the, my interest in this whole thing is how to, how to bring story of large Asia during the second half of 20th century to young people in Europe and vice versa and etc. Okay, 
straight to Korean War. And uh, this is what Dennis is uh, mentioned, the demilit you know, the ironically named the demilitarized zone between North and South. It's heavily fortified. And, um, and it's um, regularly meetings are held by neutral nations supervisory commission, uh, including Swiss and Swedish officers. And speaking of visual culture, my small piece that I contribute to this collection starts with this. I recommend this film. It's called the Joint Security Area. Koreans are good at making films because you know they have to visualize in order to understand themselves in the world. And it's a very good film, and the director is excellent. I know his younger brother better than himself, but it's called Joint Security Area. It's basically it's a heavily militarized zone, and there is absolutely no contact between northern and southern Korean counterparts, whereas a Swiss counterpart and Swedish counterpart are free to move between north and south. So who is given freedom and who is not given freedom? And whereas this, the joint security area is jointly managed by Northern and Southern as well as Neutral Nations Commission, but a few sentinels in joint security area, Northern and Southern counterpart, develop certain secretive friendship, you know, and it is between this young man uh, on the foreground, uh, the military police of Southern Army, and this man at the center, an officer from Northern Security Forces. So they de develop this friendship. They visit in the thick of night and share noodle soup and, and talk about their families. And, but something goes wrong, and there is an accident. And um, I was told that by the director that he was des desperately looking for Swiss actress to play. And then, so the, the, the neutral, neutral commission gets involved and, and then they have to investigate this incident. So the officer is sent from Switzerland, but they couldn't find a you know, the proper Swiss um, actress. So they ended up with Korean art actress, but the, her background is her mother is Swiss, her father is Northern Korean, who, were, who took, uh, at the end of the war, among the prisoner of war, do you want to go back to North Korea or do you want to stay in free country, which is South Korea, which is not that free, but free country, or do you reject both of them, or go third party, neutral nations. So quite a few of them chose Argentina and Brazil as their destination. So her father, she's a mixed child. Her father is Northern communist soldier, officer, who chose neutral nation, where he met his future wife, who is a Swiss national. And so Major Sophie John is a so became a um, Swiss officer of Swiss Army. So she investigates. It's a, it's, it's a riveting story. And so it is confrontation between a Swiss officer, although she's half Korean, and then, but she thinks like a Swiss. So we have to get into the bottom of the story. And then that is, is the job of Neutral Nations Commission. Whereas her her partners in this investigation, these two Korean men, both one is northern and the other is southern. And it's a complex story, but it's, 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 it's a reasonably tragic story that uh, Sophie doesn't succeed in getting to the bottom of the story, whereas the two men uh, keep telling her that you can't pursue neutrality in this in this particular incident. There is no such thing as neutral existence in, this, in our land. So there is a confrontation between the legal and political position of neutrality versus existential position of non-neutral existence in this particular world. Anyway, so, um, so I, um, just this, this 
this contribution gives a brief, very brief uh, meaning of uh, the Korean War in 1950 and 1953, the Switzerland um, involved itself as a neutral nation. As um, one is, um, it's, it's broadly a shared view among new works on Korean War that Korean War was a really pivotal world, a historical event. It made the first world world, first world as such. So it, it contributed to making the United States as a major military political power, as a military empire as such. And in uh, Charles Boland, US ambassador to Soviet Union from 1953 and 57, this is not part of the text because it's kind of boring the part of my essay. Uh, he said uh, in 1953, it was the Korean War not the World War II that made us, United States, a world military political power, unquote. So it made the first world war, first world as such, as we know it uh, today. And it made the second world as we know it today, according to increasing number of researches. And those of you who are interested in history, it's not Soviet Russia that it involved itself militarily in the Korean conflict, it's China. So China fought against the United States in single space in modern history. Young men from the United States and not so young men from China took each other's lives was during the Korean War. And this, this episode is brought forward forcefully in contemporary China. It's a, it's a mega box. It's, it's, it's showing now in China, not out, not not elsewhere, is, is kind of reservoir of Changjin uh, battle when the China claims that it decimated the US 7th Division. But it's not true, both were decimated you know, by the coal, it was below, nine, below 20 and 30s. Anyway, this heroic, it became a truly heroic episode in contemporary China in amidst this ongoing and tragic Unfortunately, very risky, uh, you know, American confrontation as we uh, face up to in today's world. So the this Korean War as an international war involving U.S. and China Chinese power is back to our present many years later, and how we saw 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 this particular dimension of war will have much say. Uh, to the future of world peace in the years to come. And this is another, it, I don't mention it in the book, but it's, it's a long-held uh, story of Korean War, the Mao's eldest son, Mao Anning. He was one of the first casualties of Chinese volunteer army by South African fighter jet. You know, crazy, why South Africa there? Anyway. So he's, uh, he's buried in North Korea and uh, he's revered in China, less in North Korea, but he's, can, it's, he's a political symbol of a scene of North Korean friendship. I want. And also, the, very briefly, the, um, uh, the, anyway, Korean War was uh, enabled the birth of the other world in the second half of the 20th century, called the Third World. In the 1955, leaders of newly independent nations in Asia and Africa, they brought themselves together into a meeting among post-colonial leaders in Bandung, Indonesia. And then one of the key questions in, throughout this meeting and is particularly uh, well understood by this is a jolly man in the middle, is a Burmese leader, Unu, was that how, the, our, our task is how not to be like Koreans, how to avoid the civil war. So how to avoid taking sides between first and second world so that this confrontation becomes our inter, internal dynamic so that we, uh, we get into a fraught, uh, the, uh, the war among brothers. So, the, then we are too weak, so we can't avoid this confrontation, this possibility 
uh, on our own, so we have to bring our strength together. That was the beginning of the formation of the Third World. Right, moving away from these big stories of how geopolitical gatherings and uh, fortifications uh, to how people actually underwent uh, at the grassroots level and, you know, shifting, let's say, from the left to the right, right? Uh, not to the combatants, but to shifting from combatants to those displaced. And then the, I mean, because I'm using too much time, so I'll skip that. And then uh, it, this is not from Korea, but it's a uh, Vietnam, Vietnam uh, the Vietnam underwent civil war much longer than Koreans. Koreans underwent military aspect of uh, civil war for three years. Vietnamese from 1945 to 1975 for 30 years. So their language and uh, language and uh, has more elaborate metaphors for the experience of civil war. So this is what Vietnamese call soido. It's made of uh, sticky rice, white rice, with black beans. The idea is when you live in this reality, you can't separate the white against the black. You have to eat them together to enjoy soido. So the, the, so the so soido in the central and southern Vietnam is a major idiom, historical idiom, that when you live in this rural world during the day, you know, like Saigon soldiers come and claim sovereignty and during the night the opposite group comes and claim sovereignty. What do you do? You, 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 you say happy, you are happy during the night and you say happy during the, during the day. So you live with both uh, this country political world and somehow live through it. And to the extent that it becomes almost normal, daily life or something around. So in the end, and the, the Cold War in Asia, in, in, in this part, uh, both starting with Korea and, and Vietnam, and I think there is growing evidence that the same, the same uh, condition is found it, 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 in large parts of contemporary Afghanistan as well, is that this, the Cold War in Asia, uh, today is a symbolized by Korean conflict, is a, is, is a reality that systematically destroy the, the space of neutrality. I mean, my neighbors and, and the space of neutrality, which in this context means just ordinary life, human life. Uh, how to be neutral from this political dynamics is systematic assault against this the neutral space which in this historical reality, it's just what we call ordinary life. As we, as we see in the room in, in Swiss Culture Center about, about daily domestic life, it's a wonderful exhibition I had, I had a view early on. So uh, in conclusion, that is um, the, the, there are two notions of neutrality that, in, that, that we work on in this book, one is um, it's a judiciary, a legal, and political concept of neutrality that was quite important, um, but not only in the f first half of 20th century, but in the second half especially. But that privileged position of neutrality uh, confronts this uh, statement uh, as in the joint security area um, story that you can't, there is no such space of neutrality in our lived world. But I agree with that, so we go along with that. On the other hand, another sense of neutrality, which is just so commonsensical, ordinary, was prevalent. It, human life itself is neutral existence. It has to be free from this uh, bipolarization of politics. Uh, but these political forces systematically made, an made a systematic assault against the existence of space. But nevertheless, people, I think, in the future, one hopes, I do hope at least, uh, by the time the, uh, the uh, neutral supervisor commission has done its job in Korean Peninsula, you know, which 
this end of, re end of Korean War in literal sense, they will also have the privilege to encounter many stories that will contradict the statement uh, emanating from Joint Security Area that there is no space, there is no place for neutrality in this world. That is, stories of how many ordinary people struggle to enable such places even in hardest time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Honik, for this uh, visual parkour through, through, through your research. And I really like the, uh, the anecdote about, uh, about the sticky rice in, in Vietnam, which actually you know, reminds me of some of the founda foundational studies uh, in anthropology um, of mainland Southeast Asia, uh, which, uh, you know, for, 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 for whom ontology in Southeast Asia is rice. And I don't know if that could be extended to, 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 to East Asia as well. But I'm just saying this um, not to talk about rice, but um, to, 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 to fall back to, 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 the, to the question at the core, um, one of the question, questions at the core in your work and in, in your work, Denise, which is that of um, the foundation of social, social bond. Uh, you've done a lot of, of work on kinship. Um, you just uh, spoke about uh, neutrality uh, as a space where uh, uh, social life is regulated. But I want to fall back um, onto Denise's work and, um, and, um, and um, ask you about um, the way uh, engaging and examining you know, uh, this visual material, um, seeing the daily life of these soldiers, the way they engage with the local populations, with the other uh, military missions, um, and basically uh, you know, uh, seeing something that is, that is mundane with all the, the, the negative and, 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 and positive sides. Uh, what has it done you know, uh, to you as, uh, as someone who has to navigate this material and, and the kind of, um, and your project you know, of, uh, of, uh, of deconstructing Swiss neutrality, but also deconstruct, de deconstructing yet another form of neutrality, which have, we haven't really talked about, but it's, uh, which is uh, the supposedly uh, neutrality um, of, the, of, of the camera. It's a technical media. So um, uh, um, uh, these soldiers, you know, um, innocently, but not always filming the surroundings, going on these, uh, on these weekend missions um, and, and actually making films uh, 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 um, out of them, but um, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the kind of patriarchal and uh, and colonial, uh, uh, co uh, colonial gaze, which you know doesn't 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 announce itself. Um, yeah, uh, mm. how does that do you know um, to 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 your project of um, of uh, of critically engaging with um, uh, uh, with this field of question? Yeah, maybe I can start and also connect to what Heone Kwon brought to us from his perspective. Um, of his own research, to the desire of, of um, a neutral space, in a sense also of a safe space. We can say that neutrality might bring to people that don't want to decide on which side of the world power they want to be. Of course, neutrality is such a complex uh, notion that it can be adapted to your own, um, to a nation's, a military mission, uh, a private life. like you can use it in the way you want, right? Because it's such a, a neutral term, right? It's kind of not, it's very hard to define, so you can really use it and kind of fictionalize into it what you would like to achieve and um, maybe also to hide another goal, right? So this is definitely something. But uh, what I would like to read is just one quote from, uh, from the book, which came from the Diaries of the Soldiers, which is... Um, what is so strangely touching here, and that it's the first quote also in the book, so what is so strangely touching here is not typically Swiss, but typically human. So I think a lot of these images I treated um, do not only speak, of course, about being Swiss, uh, but of, of, speak of, of how to be human. And, and um, I think, uh, yeah, you saw this image with the soldiers 
taking photographs of flowers, like looking at flowers, uh, creating a home. So in a sense, this constant um, navigation of what it means to be neutral um, is what stro uh, was really striking me in the material. And of course, uh, I'm kind of reading to you now the last quote of the book, which was is ending basically with a question. And this is also interesting to, to mention, although the Swiss soldiers were often extremely convinced of their neutral, neutral role and uh, what this brought in a kind of soft power, we can say, in this conflict, that could also help them to establish their own nation's place in the world and the political situation in the, after the Second World War, so we should not forget that. But um, so the, the last quote is, um, are we neutral, are the others neutral? I have often asked myself. So it's a really s basic um, kind of self-reflective question. And also the film ends with these uh, kind of self-reflecting questions. Because I think uh, we have in this uh, supervisory mission, we have Sweden, Switzerland, and then as the Western neutral that would stand basically for the Western world, for the democratic world, and then the, the the representatives of the North, which would be Poland and Czechoslovakia representing the communist countries. And this constant ne negotiation of what does it mean to be neutral, even within uh, these four nations, uh, commissions, it was absolutely impossible to be neutral. And this is shown through all the material, basically. Like, um, there was always a, represent a representation of the world ideology you would arrive with in this context. So what for me was really striking in that sense is, um, yes, this, this kind of space, we can never be still. We always have to basically move, you know? So, so neutrality would almost, if there is some such thing as uh, complete neutrality, I think it would be death because somehow, you know, then, then you might be really balanced, I don't know. But, um, as long as there is life, there's always movement from, from you know, your thoughts, what you personally are living through, through the kind of, you know, from the micro to the macro. We spoke about this now sometimes, you know, like maybe in your personal life. And this is often also in these um, quotes that from their personal life, they had a very clear stand of wh where they think, uh, where, they, where they are and what they think is right, like convinced that democratic um, principles are much better and we are here um, to bring peace and we know how peace works as Swiss neutrals and um, but then on the end and to say like okay these are the communist neutrals they might be called neutral as well but they would uh, of course they're not as neutrals as we are so there's always this distinction and I think this is something I took yes it's all about movement and that's also the beauty that even while writing history or writing histories um, rewriting histories uh, yes we can kind of understand this kind of melange uh, hybrid space that neutrality might offer so maybe there is a space for neutrality Space and time for, 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 for the audience, because I think we, um, we've spoken quite, 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 quite a bit already. Mm -hmm. um, and we have um, some time to, to, to take questions from the audience, if there are any. Uh, they can be asked in, in French and we will translate. Um, and um, I mean, if not, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, keep, uh, keep, we'll keep conversing. Because yes about the zone which is very artificial, was very artificial and not alive and very controlled and not the real life, uh, reflecting real life. Now today we face the fact that South Korea is, um, is neutral, uh, democratic in that sense and has a huge boom in art and architecture. Um, is it only infused through the market, or how do you see that? Today, today, South. South, I think it's a multiple, it, it, it is still, um, I, th I think when you live in a state of seas too long, it becomes so ordinary, so the, on daily life, 
um, the risk or the threat of a uh, major armed crisis is, seems so distant, but at the same time, it's just around the corner. So I think people do live in this uh, duplex reality in which war is so far away, well, 70 years ago, on the other hand, is so near you. And um, so the, it's good that the young, younger generations are um, um, encountering uh, such stories of um, destruction of neutral space uh, through films. And then, and then, so the artistic world, I think, is, is, is doing good uh, in um, bringing back certain stories from the past, but not in heavy dose, but uh, to the extent that people can, people can relate to it. So I think in, in, in such a way that I think the film industries and, and uh, et cetera is doing well. Uh, is doing well because it's one, one vital means, art and uh, performative art is one vital means uh, with which the post-war generations can interact with the, um, uh, the reality uh, which is not very far away. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, I had a question. I was wondering if you could um, tell us more about the source, uh, the, uh, the Swiss soldier that you were uh, using the image from. Um, mm -hmm. So, in the sense that it's still military archive. So, is it military because it was like a, a war zone, so it was classified, or do you think mm -hmm. that these images were having some kind of other purpose, like showing it to other military forces in Europe, or or was it just personal images that they might just mm. classify because it's war zone? Or do you maybe not know about that? <laughs> no, 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 I, I, um, I do know it's a, it's, there's a complex status of these images because they were taken in free time, in leisure time, of military personnel that was of course also off, off, on duty and off duty. So, and of course again here it's, it's difficult to draw the line, but we, we can say they were in a, new t in a military position uh, while taking the photographs, but they had, didn't have a mandate. So the archive is in the military Swiss archive, um, but it is not stored and not classified as military relevant um, material. So it is more a collection of these um, people who had served a part of their life in Korea for the Swiss military and collected uh, so it's basically more their own initiative to collect the material as a memory um, and the archive where it's stored is the military archive. So it has an ambiguous uh, position in a way. But the, the photographs and also the film rolls were given over to the uh, Bibliothèque am Gisonplatz, that's the proper name basically of the archive in Bern. And it is also accessible for researchers and, and so on, of course, to analyze it. So it, it, they kind of give it out of their hand also. So this is why this was even po possible for me to work with these photographs. Um, yeah, so in that sense, yes, I hope that answered a little bit the status of these um, images. I mean, what I work here with is mostly when, when someone died, they would give over uh, the archive which stayed with the family norma normally for you know a long time and then it would come to the archive so this is also yeah kind of why I worked only with images from the 50s 60s up to yeah end of the 70s yeah and I think a crucial thing you write about is that unlike uh, the American mission which had uh, an official cinema service military yes. <laughs> cinema service yeah. Switzerland did, didn't have one and I think it's also quite um, uh, it's, it's, it's quite um, relevant in terms of the relationship more globally of, of the Swiss mission uh, yeah. towards the, 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 you know, the, 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 the rising hegemonic power that mm. the, the, the U.S. became in these years. Yes. I mean, the influence of the uh, U.S. 
cinematic um, culture in the military zone was really enormous. And, and they watched film a lot. Oh, yes. <laughs> and they did it already in the 1950s, really, when the mission started, 53. Mm. Um, they, had, they basically all lived in tents. Um, very basic life. This was not a really kind of a hotel service or something. It was really a hard uh, mission in the beginning, at least. Mm. But for the kind of uh, to you know get their morals together again, they had these film screenings every night. And mm. I have to do further research in what this program exactly was. But definitely, as you already said, like it, the influence of visual images of, of moving images was enormous and they really r took this as a tool to then even access, exactly as you said, like they had this access to the North, mm. which South Koreans didn't have, um, or I mean, just very exceptional people. So in that sense, they, they used the camera as a, as a tool to enter the North and represent again, kind of their friendship, you know, with both sides. And often it became, the camera really became a diplomatic tool also to say like, we are truly neutral, we can travel to the north and the south. And of course this is not really true, I mean, the, as you say, the, the camera in that sense did not stay neutral, it was in that sense in the service of the Swiss and what they wanted with this mission there. Any other questions uh, from the audience or? I had a question, can I ask a question? <laughs> but I, what I'm very curious is, uh, so this material is uh, stored in, in Switzerland at the mm -hmm. moment, right? And it basically documents uh, Korean life, culture, also a lot of uh, knowledge, right? Like of agriculture, mm -hmm. Of, uh, of, of, uh, of rural life, um, of course through the lens of Swiss people that are coming from a really different world, but what is the worth of such um, material to Korea today? This is really a question I was burning to ask uh, you. So many Denise, uh, when I was watching the um, video footage, I thought some of the um, uh, images they took in North Korea, mm -hmm. in very North Korea's very early reconstruction period. Yes, you can see that actually the in terms of economic life, truly the either there is no difference between South and North, and North was higher in living standard, and and uh, and also the the disciplining of children was already a very high emotion and you know good kids mm -hmm. the northern kids are good kids behaving well and southern kids are less good and you know some some people will think like that okay. and then so um, it's as 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 i think historical evidence is 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 is, is, is valueless in mm. this footage particularly that domain mm. yeah. and then the, the, the critical critical visual studies, and that's another matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the interesting thing is this camera they carry around has double sense of neutra neutrality or objectivity, both geopolitical as well as aesthetical. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting theme, yes. the merging of these two notions of objectivity or neutrality mm. in this particular practice, which is very interesting. Yeah. This was kind of the title, um, Oh, there's a question? Yeah, well, uh, I okay. Don't think I, need the I just want to follow up on that. Like, because you were saying it's part of the, of the testimony of, of the fact, etc., that you were talking about them. So, what's the relation to the memory of this war that is not yet ended today in Korea? Because in the, in the, in the explanation of the exhibition, it's stated that it's not really a cold war, that it's more like a, a hot war. Warm war, 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 warm war
I think it's an interesting, very, very important question, actually, because uh, the there to think of war, to how to remember war is such a vital question. You know, how to remember 1914 and 1918 it creatively is vital for Europe's democratic future, and how to remember 1939 to 45 in a really in a creative way is is it's hard to exaggerate. But uh, in the Korean context, the I think the south southern part, as Christina mentioned, is moving away from northern bosses can attack us. That sort of scheme. So if we say it's a civil war, the northerners could have attacked us, and southerners could have attacked them. You know, and both wanted to attack the other. Um, and uh, to create unified singular nation state worthy of the name in their own thinking. So you take position with American Imperium or Soviet Imperium, you want to bring the whole, whole nation into, you know, align with one world, take side properly. And that is the origin of the civil war, you know, taking side. Okay, then the, the, I think this is a difficult thing to say, I think. On the other hand, this, the slowly waking up younger generation, that what have we done you know, by, create, by trying to create unified you know, like nation state or something? We created a civil war, affected Northeast Asia, affected first world, second world, and uh, complicated the world. So why don't we we, it's really high time to take the responsibility. Let's not complicate the world anymore. And, you know, and the peace is enough for, between us. And let's, you know, let's stop complicating the world. I mean, the world is so complicated anyway. And then, so that's sort of vision for taking responsibility. Even though taking side was not their own responsibility. They were bound to take side. They were forced to take side, but they took side and created this war and how to take responsibility for this. And I think that um, is uh, one way of remembering the Korean War properly or creatively in the future for the next generation. Yeah. And they may need something like a 1968 generation rebellion against <laughs> you know, previous generation. I'll ask uh, perhaps uh, a last question as you know, we, 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 we reach the hour almost um, to, to both of you to, 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 to conclude. Um, I mean, just you know, um, a couple of years ago when, when Pak Gane was, was ousted and Moon Jae-in came into power, there were lots of hopes for, for a reunification of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Korea. So um, Honik, I wanted to ask you what, what you know, how, how you foresee that, that, that question and Denise, um, as someone, you know, researching neutrality, if you see, you know, any 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 re relevance or role of uh, of uh, of, uh, of, um, of Switzerland and and, um, and artistic work to to, to articulate, um, you know, something you know hopeful for the future. <laughs> Big question. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer. No. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I personally started shunning the concept of unification. And the German unification, you know, in the 1990s, it's, 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 a, it's almost a generation ago. The, to talk about unification is, um, it's, you, the concept of unification, it, when German unified was kind of hopeful world. But nowadays, the idea of unification, you know, it's off the record, like unification of China, for instance. It's, it, it's, um, it's hard to um, sometimes not to worry about what unification means. And so um, it, it's whether the, the, the act of unification is possible in peaceful, by peaceful means. And, and the, the very war that Korea, Korean Peninsula underwent uh, many years ago was in the, in the name of unification. So I think it's a long road. I mean, there's a, maybe in political settlement, it, it may, may, may happen. But I think at the moment, I think 
well, what personally what I'm focusing on is, is how to recover more fully um, the how this war of unification destroyed the unified neutral space of ordinary human lives for millions of people. And so contrast this um, human drama against this political drama and then and arm the next generation um, with the strength uh, against hyper, ultra, national form of nationalism. Mm -hmm. mm. And, that, and then, uh, you know, European democracy is a crisis and democracy in Asia is in crisis. How to, how to save certain islands in Asia uh, 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 to hold on to this uh, democratic spirit? Uh, that's, I mean, I don't think about unification. I think about democracy all the time. Well, I think uh, I will make it very short, but I think for the case of Switzerland, um, I kind of hope that through this claim of state, uh, state fiction, right, this project is called State Fiction, I, I think it's, it's important to not hide behind this kind of so-called neutrality anymore, but to kind of become more, uh, to open the eyes a little bit of what this neutrality did in the world which was not always uh, something good. So I think uh, it's, it's about yeah, deconstructing, basically. In the case of Switzerland, which uh, is really something else where neutrality has another function. And in that sense, I would say, uh, yeah, let's s stop hiding behind neutrality and uh, yeah, create maybe other fictions, <laughs> new fictions. So, um, well, thank you both for your, um, you know, uh, compelling interventions and uh, and um, and not conclusions, but you know you're leaving us with lots of material to 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 think about and uh, to speculate for. Yeah, hopeful, you know, um, um, uh, more hopeful uh, 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 prospects. Really, um, so uh, I would like to to uh, to to thank both of you um, and invite the audience to join me in thanking you, Denise, and congratulate you again for your your exhibition and Honik for your um, uh, really uh, wonderful presentation and uh, an essay in the, in the book. So yeah, uh, please join me in, um, in um, thank you, Denise and Honik. And thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And please join us for a drink, um, not in the courtyard as we hoped, but in the accueil. <laughs>